the Philadelphia Eagles, everything's on the table for day one of the NFL draft. They could trade up. They could trade down. They could stay put at 22nd overall. Who are the top prospects they would target in all three scenarios? We'll get into that and more coming your way right here on Locked On Eagles. You are Locked On Eagles, your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome on in, Eagles fans. I'm Louis DiBiase, co-host of the Locked On Eagles podcast. Eagles analyst also over at Bleacher Report. He's Gino Camilleri, my co-host. He's also an analyst at Bleacher Report and our scouting director on today's edition of Locked On Eagles. We're going to explore scenarios where the Eagles could trade up. Who would it be for if they stay put at pick 22? Who's the top prospect there? And if they trade down, who would be the targets plus Who's the Eagles' best defensive player now that Hassan Riddick has been traded and our biggest draft misses a day after April Fool's? All that more coming your way. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers, you're going to get $200 back in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 back if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown today to get started. So Gino, and we've said this a few times on the show before, like with the Eagles, we kind of have a good idea of what they do in the draft after covering this now for seven years together and watching the Eagles and Howie Roseman draft since we were kids. They go trenches, they like to trade up, they like to trade down, they like to move around the board, like we kind of have a good idea of what's to come. Just really not in one particular order because there's years that they trade up, there's years they do trade down, sometimes a little bit of both. Very rarely do they stay put. So I wanted today to explore if they do take these certain paths, who would the prospects be that they have their sights on versus who we would want in that scenario. We did this for Bleach Report, and I thought it was a good exercise. So definitely want to see what our listeners and viewers think here. Because when you look at like a trade-up, I think it's obvious what we would want, but I'm not so sure like that's what Howie Roseman would target. Currently, and those of you on YouTube, you're seeing me look to the side here. I'm looking on FanDuel right now at what Vegas thinks the Philadelphia Eagles are going to do. So the odds on favorite right now is cornerback at minus 115, defensive lineman or edge at plus 185, Mm -hmm. offensive line at plus 270, and then everything else after that is far, far away wide receiver at plus 2,200 safety at plus 3,100. So it kind of boils down to cornerback D line or offensive line where I think you and I have kind of figured it out. It's going to be there at the end of the day. And I think Gino, for me, the heart pick versus the head pick for what they would do in, let's say a trade up scenario, because that's what they do most of the time. Since Howie Roseman has been the general manager again in 2016 and onward, he has only stayed put at two picks in the first round. Jalen Rager in 2020, Nolan Mm -hmm. Smith last year, but even last year we saw he traded up for Jalen Carter. The majority of his trades have been moving up the board. He did trade down back in 2018, collecting that second round pick and getting Dallas Goddard from the Baltimore Ravens, but normally they're aggressive, so that's what I would predict happens this year. And although corner would be the betting favorite, it's what I would want. The hard pick would be that better be for Kenyon Mitchell of Toledo, The head is telling me like a tackle, like Troy Fotanu would be the number one prospect I think they trade up for. The kid from Washington that's very athletic. Jeff Stoutland's a big fan of him. The heart, I again would want corner, but I think the head's saying it would be a tackle. That's why these mock drafts that we do on Mondays. And folks, if you watched our mock draft yesterday, <laughs> go back. We've done hundreds of these things. We do them all the time. People did not like the, the group one. of players we selected. We try to switch it up to yeah, inform our listeners, our everydayers on new prospects all of the time. Mm-hmm. But the head is one thing. The yeah. heart is another. Howie Roseman is always in the back of our mind. And with our heart, it's completely different, right? And my heart is always it always thinks back to the Darnell Savage, the Chauncey Gardner Johnson, that safety class. It's like, how great would it have been to draft one of those guys? But in the back of your mind, you're thinking Howie Roseman, what's he going to do? And for me, it was Josh Jacobs in that 2019 draft. So yeah, we were both thinking heart and then he trades up for a tackle. Andre Dillard. And exactly. And one of the things that you always have to focus on with Howie Roseman is that if there is a guy he wants, i.e. last year with Jalen Carter, the year before that, 
or two years before that, rather, with Devontae Smith, he's not going to sit there and let the board fall to him, right? He is going to go up and get his guy. Even if he trades down, like that year he traded down and then traded up to go get Devontae. People forget that they had that trade with Miami to move mm-hmm. from 6 to 11, if I'm yeah. correct, right? Yes. Or was it 12? Or 12, it was 12. Because that, yes, and then they moved to 10 with the yep. Cowboys to leap the Giants who were at 11 because they were going to draft Devontae Smith. And we know the old Gettleman reaction when he went and drafted Kadarius Tony. But Howie Roseman, he has the assets now, especially after trading away Hassan Riddick. And you know all these picks that they have in the fifth round. I mean, they have a 100 of these things, it feels like. If it's going to cost him the equivalent of a third or fourth round pick to move up four to six spots potentially to which normally is what it takes guarantee like, his guy which yeah. probably is a cornerback or an offensive lineman but if it's how we pick it's offensive line for sure i'll be shocked if one of those guys is there at 17 or 18 let's say one of the offensive linemen i think there's a surefire top five that you would go and get one you would think joe all you're thinking olufushanu you're mm-hmm. thinking why am I drawing a photo probably from uh, Fatanu Fuaga, Fuaga. And then, who is the last one that, that might be it because Guyton I wouldn't four. consider Maybe yeah no Guyton you would not take even. at 22 and yeah. Mims is probably a trade down type of and you know I think player. tackle those guys have a better chance of falling inside that like 15 to 20 range or maybe you could even say like 17 to 22 but corner I'm not so sure. I think you're going to have to get farther up to go get maybe not Nate Wiggins, but Mitchell or Terry and Arnold from mm-hmm. Alabama. You might have to get higher to go get a corner. It almost feels like a couple of years ago when you made that trade with the Saints and how fast or the AJ Brown trade rather with the Titans that how fast the wide receivers were coming off of the board and Jameson Mm -hmm. Williams flies off the board and Chris Olave flies off the board and boom, all of a sudden Garrett Wilson is off the board and Howie Roseman is sitting there with his hands in his pockets. He's like, Oh, well, guess what? I had this trick up my sleeve here. Well, can he turn around and go do exactly that to go and get one of those guys? If there's anybody in the league to do it, Lou, you have to, Oh, it's him. Howie Roseman. Yeah, and he's given up, as you mentioned, like a three or a four or multiple picks like that to go get Andre Dillard, Jordan Davis. That's mm-hmm. normally the compensation. It's not like he's moving from 22 to 10. It's normally a smaller move up in that way, so he doesn't give up as much. Regardless, mm-hmm. I think if he trades up, it's going to have need in mind. It's going to be, you know, I think the biggest needs right now are cornerback. I'd say linebacker, but I think he views it as corner and long-term tackle. So that would be the two positions I think they target. But then, you know, if they sit at 22... I think the conversation does shift a little bit more to not that they wouldn't prioritize corner or tackle, but I think it does get more into the BPA conversation, best player available, where Mm -hmm. if a Chop Robinson's available from Penn State, that would be on the board. Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Let's say a Brock Bowers fell from Georgia at tight end. I think the flexibility would be there a little more. The urgency wouldn't be as much to force a need like it would if they trade up. I think if they trade down or stay at 22, really any position could be available. You're trading up with a target in mind. You don't yes. just trade up to trade up, right? No, Let's you're not trading back. up for the best player available. We just want to get to a 13 and then see who's there. No. <laughs> Let's take a, a step back to... And that's look. what drives me crazy, Gene, about BPA conversations because nobody just trades up and just takes the best player available. No, they're trading up for a need. Let's go back to your best friend's draft and Carson Wentz. Yeah. Lou, Lou and him are going to have a buddy, buddy cop show one day. Carson Wentz and Lou DiBiase. <laughs> you're, so, you're sick, man. If <laughs> those of you listening, you just held up a Carson Wentz Funko pop. But let's go back to that draft, right? And there was always that conversation for those who really just needed to fish and farm for clicks. Oh, what if. Carson Wentz was picked at number one. Would they just have taken Jared Goff? No, they would not have traded all exactly. of those assets right. and nearly quote unquote mortgage the future. As people yeah. would say to put a 50, 50 chance on the table to maybe get their guy. No, they are going to trade up with the intention in mind. Mm-hmm. Go back to the year when they traded for Devonte Smith, they moved back. And then they had that trade in place with Dallas. Well, before the draft took place, that if he is on the board and the Giants are right behind him and they haven't moved up yet to get Devontae Smith, they were going to go up and get him. And like you said, it's usually for a three or four, compile a bunch of picks to Mm -hmm. get around that value. 
I could see the Eagles at the end of the day, if you could say right now where they're going to pick, I'd say 17. I was going to say, if I had to rank the three scenarios with the likelihood of them happening, I'd say trade up is number one, most likely. I would say probably a trade down and then staying put. They just, yep. they very rarely stay put. Last year, Howie Roseman even had to mention it at the press conference. Like I had to kind of talk myself into not moving and just taking Nolan Smith because I'm not used to that. And I like to work the phones. Like we all know how he, he even said like it took him some discipline to just say, sit there and take this player that we really want because they're always trading. So it's going to be really interesting to watch what happens, but I'm with you, Gino. I'd say, where do they pick? It's not a 22. It's probably in that 16 to 20 range. And if they trade down, like you said, a couple minutes ago, I think, like you said, it's best player available yeah. on our board. Then you can start talking All receiver, tight picks, end, linebacker. Four picks in probably 30 selections or so. Yeah. And in this draft, what's the difference between player 25 and player 60. Not much based on our mock drafts, Gino. I'm starting to think that the value there isn't a whole lot different. So yeah, especially because it's different from team to team too, because when it comes to the Eagles, it's going to look a lot different from everybody else in your division as well. So what's your cup of tea at offensive tackle? Let's say you're sitting there and Amarius Mims is your guy and you're like, okay, we have him and we're willing to take JC Latham as well. Let's move down six or seven spots. Mm-hmm. Let's acquire another pick on the, on day two yeah. in the third round. Let's say we can use that to leverage a trade up and go get somebody else at linebacker or cornerback on day two, early day two, and maybe even have a trade in place the next day, ready to go. If your guy starts to fall a little bit and I'm glad to hear Howie Roseman has a little bit of discipline when it comes to that, because yeah, he, you have to take your guy. If the board says, take yeah, your something, guy, you shouldn't trade just a trade either. Gene. No, yeah. if there's a clear outlier on your board and it's mm-hmm. too good to be true, go and take and it. Nolan Smith, I think was that last year. Like I don't, and again, we'll see what he does in year two. But mm-hmm. at that time, I thought he had no business falling that far. I was okay with him being that pick before they traded up for Jalen Carter with their first round, the first first round selection they had. So yeah, overall, I think they're going to trade. I think it would probably be for tackle to move up the board. I'm hoping for corner for sure. Gino, I want to get back to the roster they have right now coming up next. Been thinking a lot about the post Hassan Reddick world, what this defense looks like. Reddick was their best player on defense the last two years. Who is that guy now? Who's the alpha on that side of the ball? We'll get into it coming up next right here on the Lockdown Eagles podcast. Today's episode of the Lockdown Eagles podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. A lot of us, we spend our lives wishing that we had more time. I think everybody does. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you to make it a priority. For us, I think part of it is doing a podcast five days a week talking about the birds. Therapy can help you find what that is that matters to you so you can do more of it. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if it doesn't work the first few times. You can find the right fit for no cost to you. Learn to make time for what makes you happy through BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today. You're going to get 10% off your first month of online therapy. Once again, that's BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off your first month. We thank BetterHelp for sponsoring the LockedOn Eagles podcast today. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. Guys, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Got to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Well, make the switch to Lockdown Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Lockdown Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team. Every day, as we all know now, Hassan Riddick is a New York Jet. He had his press conference yesterday, mentioned all good things about Philadelphia. It does, you can tell, Gino, that he really loved being in Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. being an Eagle, just a very likable player over the last two years. And I thought he was the best player on defense that they had in 2022 and in 2023. He was your closer, the clutch guy to get to the quarterback in the playoffs in the fourth quarter. Now it's interesting because it's a much younger unit. I think there's a lot more potential versus production on that side of the ball. Most of the money is now invested 
on offense and on defense, it's a lot of rookie contracts or value deals. Who is the alpha now on this defense? Like, who's that number one guy, I think, in regardless of position? You could look at it two ways. Sure. Who's going to be the heartbeat and who is going okay. to be the production leader? Give me both. The guy that is the one you're going to have to game plan against the most, I think, is the guy on the interior that you drafted with last yep. year, Jalen Carter. And yep. you look at all the advanced analytic numbers on his pressure ratings, and or if you just turn on any tape at all last year, especially and just the first half of the year, play. he was outside of Aaron Donald, maybe the best defensive tackle in football for a month and a half. And Aaron Donald is gone. I mean, is the torch going to be passed within a year to say that Jalen could potentially be the best interior defensive lineman in the National Football League? And hopefully if the trajectory continues and the top three prospect that you got at pick number nine turns out to be the guy that everybody thought. And if he does what he did for a full season from the first half of what he did last year, Lou, mm. he is going to be a guy to be reckoned with. But when you talk about the heartbeat, the soul of Philadelphia. I get why Hassan Riddick loved playing here. He was a Camden guy. Like he said, he gets what it means to be a Philadelphia Eagle. This player might not have been born around Philly, but Chauncey Gardner Johnson. I agree. He embodies what it is to be. He'll be be the face of your defense. Yeah. Jalen Carter is going to be the best player. Like you said, you put it perfectly. He's the one offenses are going to have to game plan against. Mm -hmm. Whereas Chauncey Gardner Johnson is going to be the face of that defense, the energy. He's going to be the playmaker. I think he's probably the best talent you have when it comes to all of your corners and safeties combined. So I think that's a perfect way to put it. Um, But Overall, I think you even look at Josh Sweat could be that player. Look at how good he was the first half of the year. If he doesn't disappear like the second half of the season, if you get 2022 Josh Sweat and first half of the year 2023 Josh Sweat, that could also be uh, one of the best players on this team. Talk about somebody who can't afford to not step up next year. Contract year, and this is the first time in his career, Gino, he's the guy on the defensive line. He on the is, edge, at least. He is the guy, but Bryce Huff is also going to be expected to go sure. out there and produce. And I think you can split hairs with the edge position just because they are going to rotate so much. And yeah. especially with Fangio, like how he brings pressure, it's going to come from a lot of different areas. Like expect Devin White to be involved on some blitzes as well and like see things like that. That's his bread and butter. Like that's one thing you know Devin White's going to do well yes. this year. But one CGJ is on the field. 100% of the snaps as long as he's healthy, right? So yeah. that that's the guy who the heartbeat, the team runs through him. Jalen Carter, he should be the guy who takes on the Fletcher Cox amount of snaps, which is close to 70 at times mm-hmm. for you. Is he going to be on the field every time? No. Is he going to be on the field for big impact moments and make impact plays for you? For sure. He's going to get rotated out a lot less than the edge guys, in my opinion, because those guys are going to they're going to want to keep them fresh. They they love to rotate those guys in and out. They do on the interior as well. But Jalen Carter, he he's going to be out there all three downs. He's mm-hmm. not going to be somebody that you have to take off the field because of the offense having a package that you have to go and cover against where you're potentially playing more defensive backs where you take an edge off the field to supplement for that. He is going to be in there. And being a force, like he's taking on double teams at a rate that Jordan Davis should be being double teamed sure. at this point. And heck, he's got to step up as well. He has to be that that's a completely different conversation on the defense. Like yeah. who has to make the biggest leap forward? But right now Because then you could talk Nicobe Dean, you could yes. talk Nolan Smith. There's a lot of the young guys. And you talk about at cornerback who's gonna step up there mm-hmm. in the wake of Vontae Maddox being out, but at the top. You have talent. You have leadership at multiple positions. And yeah, you lose Fletcher Cox, but BG is still going to be there, Mm -hmm. man. And it's going to be nice to have that type of mentality on the field with multiple guys and CGJ and Slay is still on the field. His play does the talking. So a lot of guys are going to have to lead in different ways. But right now, at the end of the day, who is the most likely candidate to win Defensive Player of the Year if you had to elect, elect one player from the Eagles? It's Carter. Yeah. Probably Jalen Carter. And then my second choice would probably be Josh Sweat, but maybe you're right too with Bryce Huff. Like the sack totals could be there. He's probably your best you pass rusher right now. Lunatic amount of snaps. Yeah, for sure. Crazy with it. So they've lost their best defensive player, though. It's definitely a 
you know, passing of the torch, and mm-hmm. it's really going to be a, I don't know, a hit or miss season on the defensive side of the ball. It truly is unknown because, as you mentioned, like not just talking about who's the most talented or the best player, but there's so many guys that are we don't know if they're going to step up. Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, N'Kobe Dean. Is Devin White going to bounce back in a new city? Is James Bradbury going to bounce back if he's on the team? You know, it's safety. What are you getting in Reed Blankenship and CGJ this year? Is it what you had in 2022? There's so many question marks. And even at corner, like, we don't even know if one of the starters is on the team yet. It might be through the draft. So going to be really fascinating to see what happens with a brand new defense under Vic Fangio. Coming up next right here on the Locked Eagles podcast, we're going to shift back to the draft. April Fool's was yesterday, and uh, we sent out a good tweet that I, I thought a lot of our listeners liked. So I want to get into this. Who are our the draft picks that made us look like the biggest fools from the Eagles and just are my guys in the past on this podcast? We'll get into that more coming up next right here on Locked On Eagles. As we roll along, this episode of LOE is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Right now, all type of sports are going on. NCAA women's basketball has the nation captivated, Lou. I'm telling you, Caitlin Clark is unbelievable. I've never seen somebody who can just step up and shoot from anywhere. One of the best threes of all time. If you are not following her over on her player props right now to score over the amount of points that FanDuel puts out there. You are crazy. You got to get in on the action right now. New customers to get in on this FanDuel deal. You're going to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, and you are going to put down a $5 wager. And when that wager wins on whatever it may be, whatever sport you like, whatever parlay you want to put together, you are going to win $200 in bonus bets that you can then go and bet on quite literally any sport in the world. FanDuel is the official sports book of LOE, the Lockdown Podcast Network, and the number one sports book in America. And I want you to go there today and take advantage of this deal. FanDuel.com slash Lockdown and make your first bet a big win. All right, Gino. So yesterday was April Fool's. And of course, we're diving into draft content all month long. We're only a few weeks away from the 2024 Mm -hmm. NFL draft. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about you know, yesterday I sent out a tweet. It's April Fool's. Who made you look like the biggest fool during the draft? And we can go in two different ways here from an Eagles perspective, but also just overall, like the my guys that we've pounded the table for, not just on this podcast, but we could even go back a little bit farther. We've been watching the draft our entire lives. For I think there's some obvious choices, but like who was your number one guy that the Eagles took that you were all in on that you just felt like the biggest fool over? J.J. Ortega <laughs> White. I, like, I made a song about this guy, man. I mean, I remember walking in vividly, and this is when we were recording at the WGR studio mm-hmm. in Buffalo, and I walked in one day and I said, what if the Philadelphia Eagles take J.J. Ortega Whiteside in the second round? And you kind of looked at me puzzled, and I'm like, I think it is a real possibility. And then it happens, and I said, I told you, Lou, I freaking told you, and guess what? He was abysmal. I got to pull up that audio. He was so bad. I got to pull up that podcast. (laughs) We got to put together the best hits of some of these bad ones, man. But JJ at the time, when DK Metcalf is on the board, is so such a bad use of resources. You know what's funny? I was talking to you about JJ yesterday after that tweet, and then I was just thinking about it for the day and I'm like even back then the logic does make taking a receiver made so much sense but in my head they had just backloaded that Alshon Jeffrey deal remember they had just restructured it it. no sense so were they planning on it being eventually just this plotting group of like Alshon and Jay Jaw and Mm -hmm. what Nelson Aguilar I just don't know what the style of receiver didn't make sense either for what they took it just never made any sense to me even at the start but then you look at his tape, and that's a, that, he was a big guy that really changed my paradigm in how I look at the draft. Like he was yeah. so productive for two years at Stanford. I mean, boom, well, that's why they drafted him. They were Oregon, so into the college production. Thing he back dominated there. for two seasons, yeah. multiple thousand yard years, and you're like, yeah, I guess that pick made sense for the player, but for Philadelphia, it made no sense. I'm with you. It's like, if you're going to pick anybody out of that group, pick the guy that can at least get down the field, the track star and DK Metcalf. I mean, that wasn't JJ's game. It wasn't to get 20 yards downfield. And I don't know if they knew what they were planning. 12 yards. 
And Gino, they took it was between him or Paris Campbell, which are they're just two completely different styles of receivers. So I don't know what they were planning. I don't know if they had a plan or they were just trying to get the best overall receiver and they weren't trying to do what they did a year later and just have this style in mind of speed with Jalen Rager and they went too far the opposite direction the next year. But I don't know. It just again, you know, you've mentioned like needing a basketball team though for a receiving core. I I think there's a, a balancing act. Like you don't want to reach on a certain style of receiver but you also don't want to have I think a bunch of guys that do the same thing and that's part of why my biggest I looked like the biggest fool the next year not liking Justin Jefferson Mm -hmm. because I said he's going to win the same way that Zach Ertz does and Dallas Goddard and potentially Alshon Jeffrey and Jay Joff he bounces back in year two and I looked like a moron because I was like Roseman I just was enamored with speed they could have took Rager, KJ Hamler, LaVisca Chenault, and I would have been over the moon. So no matter what they were going to do that year, I was going to look like a fool. <laughs> well, when it comes to an Eagles perspective, I, I think the court, the last two quarterback selections, like we were kind of all in on the Carson Wentz one, both you and I, and we hated the Jalen Hurts. Well, I think we, lo- we don't look like fools for the Wentz one because you don't want a Super Bowl if you don't make that pick. But the Hurts one, the I will say I looked like a sure. moron. Yeah, yeah. We, di- we definitely did. I mean, you could see our reaction after that. We were both befuddled that they were going to do this again and bring in that quarterback into the room. And now we're doing podcasts on this guy being the number one guy, clear in a way, the best option. But ooh, quarterback, do you have any like what about non e Eagles. Maybe yep. it doesn't have to be quarterback, but like for me, Malik Willis, I think all of our listeners, they won't to this day, they'll still tweet at me about Malik Willis. Number one, don't bury any of your draft takes because nobody gets no, any no, no. players right. I, I own say, it. I still kind of believe in Malik Willis a little bit. Give him a chance with Sean McVay. I will say, and I've said it multiple times, and I know people have heard me say this. I have gone on record and I was a much younger kid at the time. I said Colt McCoy, when he was coming out of Texas, is going to win multiple, oh, multiple that. Super Bowls. Multiple. I liked Paxton I mean, Lynch, dude, though, coming too, out, so I he, can't he was money, dude. Colt McCoy was really good. And so was Paxton Lynch at Memphis. You're like, this guy has... He has crazy height. He has this He's unbelievable six, arm. Like you're like this can develop. This this was Josh Allen before Josh Allen. You're thinking. I liked him more than I liked Carson Wentz in that draft class. And but that's a good point, Gino. I think I will never. I'll own that I liked Paxton Lynch back then because if you didn't like Paxton, if you weren't willing to take Paxton Lynch, you would not have been willing to take Josh Allen just a few years later. And that's what scared the Denver Broncos into not taking Josh Allen was just two years before they missed on that kind of prospect. And that's why it's such a crapshoot. And that's why, you, yeah. it, even if the, the, with me, the JJ, the process, I, I went through everything. Like I did everything I did to evaluate a prospect. And I'm like, this, it makes sense. But yeah, you got to take a chance on a six, seven guy with that didn't, mobility. It didn't and pay off. Like yeah. as long as the process is there and it makes yes. sense that Sidney Jones, another guy. Oh, that that's we're, the biggest I mean, one. We on have defense. to mention him yeah. too, man. You're th- you're thinking this guy, if he doesn't tear his Achilles, he's a top 10 pick. You want to pick him in the first round. Yeah. He tears his Achilles and he's a completely different player. He might he's go ahead of Marshawn Lattimore in that class. If he doesn't get hurt, you know, that he might be discussion. that saints pick. So it's going to be a top 15 selection. I remember we both said that's going to be the steal of the, maybe not just this draft, but the last five years where the Eagles just got a bona fide CB one in round two. And then they redshirted him in 2017. So there was all this, you know, pent up unknown, like just this Mm -hmm. urge to get him out there in 2018. And yeah, I mean, Sidney Jones, I'll give Sid some credit between him and like Rager, Jay Jaw, at least Jones made some big plays down the stretch in that playoff run of 2019, the game winning pass breakup against Dallas, a big one of the the interception in the fourth quarter against New York. And then week 17, he got another pick on the giants to help Mm -hmm. seal the division. So I'll I'll say Sid did some good things in Philly, but yeah, we thought he was going to be like an elite corner. There are guys that you can just go around like rapid fire off that oh, we, yeah. we've all like John Hightower. I, I was, I thought they were going to hit on him. I have a Quez Watkins jersey in my closet. You got Quez. I mean, some non Philadelphia. You did love Eagles. John Hightower. I completely oh, I forgot about that. John Hightower. I thought they were going <laughs> to, he just couldn't catch the football, which was yeah. unfortunate. Uh, I think if you go and look at Justin Jefferson, made us both look like fools to the point where we're even questioning our own process at the time to it made me question we, everything it made it, we were we were the puppy that lost its way we've been referencing that a lot we did not know 
how to evaluate wide receiver for the Philadelphia. No, game. after 2020, I didn't know. I didn't trust myself about and, anything and that I watched. that's what makes it so hard listening to this and then like going to my CGS life. Because CGS, it's like I just look at it from a broad point of view. To, to evaluate for a team is so much more difficult because yeah. you have to look at the broad spectrum of everything. Then you have to evaluate these guys that might not – fit you at all but you have to right. figure out where everybody else wants to pick it's them. such a tough balancing act it's, it's so difficult and then it makes you question your own morality at times and like <laughs> are we even here watching the sport do we even know what the heck we're talking about and we're, yes jj ortega whiteside over dk metcalf like let's go at, le- at least they figured it out they took Devonte smith the next year got aj yes. brown so I-, I think they simplified things and that's what you got to do in the draft and you have to though be willing to take risks on a sit like you know you're right the process you have to eventually execute for sure like you can't have that'll get you fired if you don't yeah you can't have five terrible draft classes but you're right if the process is consistently the right one normally you'll start to hit like i will always like the idea of taking Sidney jones in the second round i'll always like the idea of taking a shot on a carson wentz or paxton lynch type of prospect at quarterback because that's how again it's boom or bust but that's what you got to do sometimes to win championships so um, there's been some misses, but there's definitely been some hits as well. We'll see if there's some hits in this draft in just a few weeks for the Philadelphia Eagles. We will continue our draft coverage tomorrow and all week long. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. For Gino Camilleri, I'm Lou DiBiase signing off. As always, thank you for downloading, thank you for watching and listening, and let's go Birds. Fly, Eagles, fly.